chapter number one. Titus chapter number one. It's nice to see all of you all in bright eyed and bushy tail in the Florida sun. sun. And uh, it, we did have a great time at, at, the, at the prison y yesterday. Uh, Brother Bob Mark is here, and, and Ruth and Merlin Frum will be, they're not here yet, but they'll be here in a little while. They've been carrying, Merlin's been doing that ministry for about 20 years. I started going in there over 20 years ago when Brother Rouser was doing that. And then Brother Frum came along, and Brother Rouser got where he couldn't do it. He had to move away because of some health problems. Brother Merlin did it, and then Merlin's getting where he's got some health challenges, and Brother Bob comes along, and he's, he's taking it up. And there are guys there that have been there in that ministry all that time. And the fascinating thing about it is that where we go to Avon Park Monday night, Brother uh, Dwayne's been going there for so long, that ministry there really came from some fellows from Sumter that got transferred over there and started preaching right division and teaching the Bible and uh, he developed a, a group there. And that, that's a, that's, it's a fascinating thing to see that. There's a group up toward one of the, one of the prisons up toward uh, uh, Ocala that has a group like that that went from Sumter. And the, uh, the Florida prisons have this thing where they, after you've been in an institution five years, they, might, they, they transfer you. Or you're subject to be transferred. You don't necessarily have to be. And uh, it seems that they took some of the leaders of the group there and transferred them. And good. <laughs> you know, if, if you're in prison, you have a prison ministry. You know, we, we have to fight and, and cajole and get passes and get permission to go in. They're in. And, uh, <laughs> of course, we get out, and, uh, but uh, so far I've been able to get out. That, that's the good thing. But uh, anyway, when I left Chicago Wednesday morning to come down for that, I don't know when you guys left, it was like this, is minus three degrees. I told folks, we, I was walking on water. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> in minus three degrees. And, uh, but, you know, it, it's great to, it, it, great to be here this weekend. We'll have a great time in the Word, and as, uh, as we always do. And I appreciate all the work that the, the brethren and the sisters do to put this meeting together. Um, we have a real timely topic this weekend. Holding fast the faithful Word. Well, you know, we, we certainly live in a, in, in a, um, in, in a time where, where that's a, a questionable thing. Uh, we live in a world where, where there's very little faithfulness. We live in a world in tremendous turmoil. We live in a culture as Americans where, where you look around you, and if, you're, you know, if you've lived as long as I have, and you, you look out at the world, and you, you, you've seen the world transition from a very stable, uh, basic kind of a culture that, uh, that had its underpinnings under it, had its feet under it, had, had an understanding of what it was doing, where it was going, to a world that's topsy-turvy, that can't even define its own institutions. When you get, a, you get into a culture that doesn't know how to define marriage, you get into a culture that doesn't know how to define uh, uh, personhood, you get into, you're in a, in a culture, Isaiah t told, talked to Israel about, woe to them that call good evil and evil good. They call light darkness and darkness light. And to have watched a, a nation turn in its culture in, 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 in uh, four or five decades from one way to the other way. And if you're young, if you're under 30, you got no idea what I'm talking about the old way. You just know what it is now. And that's a, that's a, a really a fascinating thing. I, I went to church with uh, Merlin and his uh, wife Wednesday night there in Inverness. And, and it, it was a, just a, a sweet little group of people, saints, all of them uh, older than I am, <laughs> Merlin said, he says, well, they're all our age. And that's who comes to church on Wednesday night most of the time in, in most churches. And uh, we sat there, and the pastor was, was gone. He and his wife were off on vacation. And so they, 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 had a, they, they had a prayer meeting, and then they sang. And they sang the old hymns. And <laughs> the lady that was usually the song leader, she was sick. So she had, they had a 92-year-old lady came and played the piano. But she only knew seven hymns. So they sang all of her seven hymns. And I sat there and I'm listening, and, and I'm listening to these, these dear saints, and they're singing these songs with gusto and joy and, and, and excitement, just like you if, you know, if they were what you were raised on, you would do. And I thought, how, 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 how wonderful it is 
that, that folks can, can maintain and enjoy the faith like that, and how sad it is that, that younger generations haven't had the opportunity to know those wonderful hymns that carry our faith, carry your, the, the doctrine of, of who we are in Christ and the joy that it is to be in Christ, and to carry it in a way that, that connects you with your history. You know, it's a wonderful thing to have some institutional memory in your life. And, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to decry people that, you know, modern things as opposed to just say, wow, what a connection there is to have. I know in our ministry in Chicago, we, we, we still sing the old songs. And we do that, and I tell our young people in, in our assembly, my wife and I, and the, you know, the three or four or five couples like us, we're the old heads. And most of our folks are younger and, and, and young couples and family people and so forth. And we have several hundred people in the assembly and, and, and it's younger people. And I, I tell them, you can listen to whatever you want to listen to during the week. When we come here, I'm going to be sure you learn some of these songs that connect you with the past <laughs> and connect you with your roots. And, and you know what, I, f I find they can do it. And I find they enjoy it. We have, they'll bring some of their friends sometime, and they'll say, man, that music was weird. <laughs> and I say, well, you know, if I went to your church or some other church where you, you I might think your music was weird too. But I bet my music is better weird than your music is. <laughs> and we tease about that. But the connection to, and having that stability, you know, the psalmist said, if the foundation be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? And when you live in a culture that's in that flux, as our world is, you're living in the kind of a world that Titus lived in, the kind of a world that the Apostle Paul lived in. You need to understand, they did not live in a Christianized culture. Paul, Titus, Timothy, the people we think about as heroes of the faith, they lived in a pagan world. When Paul began to preach the Lord Jesus Christ and to the Gentiles, he didn't go out and, and preach among people that even knew who Jesus Christ was. They had never heard of who he was. They didn't know who he was. He's talking to people who, who, who had basically no information at all in those kind of things. And when he found people that knew anything about the Bible, they were, they were lost Jews who, who, who had already rejected everything there was that, that he was going to say. And so he went into a, 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 a paganized world. And I think about... You know, we're, when people say, well, we're facing the world going pagan again, listen, it's not a big deal to be scared of. Now, if you're worried about your 401k program and that's all you're worried about, then you can be scared. You look at the stock market today, you're probably sweating. You know, if you're worried about real, if you're trying to be, all that, if that's all there is for your life, but listen, if you're a believer, that isn't all there is to your life. There's something far more important to your life than all of those kind of things. I don't discount financial stability and financial accountability and responsibility. I'm just saying there's more to it than that. And as you look at the world out there, I think, I've, said to, I've, I've told our, our folks for, year, for, for some time now, you are living, it, you're right in the middle of the most exciting, impactful decade of your life right now. And you're about halfway through it. And I don't care if you're 20 years old, there'll never be a decade that'll be as impactful in your lifetime as the one you're living in now. I don't care if you're 80 years old, there will never have been a decade in your life that was as impactful as the one you're living in right now. That's the, that's the kind of a culture uh, that, that we live in in our nation right now. This passage about holding fast the faithful word, that's the, that's the call, that's the clarion call for where we are. And that's why Paul writes, when he writes it to Timothy, it makes it such a tremendously important thing for us to grasp as believers, and especially as grace believers, as people who have some understanding about, about the Word of God that can open God's Word for folks to understand and rejoice in. I see it all the time. My, my office, my wife was reminding me just a moment ago that last Monday... Uh, I, I got a note from Debbie and Ray, or from Debbie, in the uh, Monday evening. They had 50 phone calls last Monday by 4 o'clock from radio, television, outreach ministry. Most of those phone calls are not arguing. Now, some of them do. That's when she gives them to Ray. <laughs> <laughs> Although, I've got to tell you, Debbie can handle them pretty well, too. <laughs> but... Uh, a few of them, but most of them are inquiring. 
from the week, the ministry from the weekend, the, the radio, the TV, that kind of stuff. And that's, there's a hunger out there for, for truth. And as you proclaim it and you make it known, there's a hunger for authenticity. Not, not the sham, not the religion, not, not just the stuff, but for the real thing. Not for programs and being system men and, 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 and promoting somebody's system, or I'm going to promote that system and this, this organization, but truth. To hold fast to the faithful word. So it's going to be exciting to go through this passage this weekend and to look at the, the, the various faithful things that are here. The, if you start in verse 5, just to get the, Titus 1 verse 9 is the verse, holding fast the faithful word as, it, as he has been taught. But I'm going to start reading verse 5 with you and read down to it so you can get the context because this verse doesn't just pop out of nowhere. Verse 5, Titus 1 5, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Paul is going to, he leaves Titus in Crete. Now, the purpose here is to teach all these verses, but I give you an idea of what's going on. Titus and Paul had gone to Crete, a little island out in the Mediterranean. Preached the gospel. People had gotten saved. Paul is going to leave. He leaves Titus there to set things in order. There, the, 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 the group, when Paul established, going to establish a beachhead for the gospel, he didn't establish Bible classes. He didn't establish just nothing. He established local churches. So he, he leaves Titus there to, to take those little groups of saints across that island and establish them, get them equipped doctrinally, and organize them together as saints to do the work of the ministry. You remember Ephesians 4, 4 verse 12? If you want to turn over there, because maybe you don't remember it. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 12. When he talks about, set in order those things that are wanting and ordain elders, he's talking about getting the local church established. Well, what's that all about? That's not an, he's not talking about an organization in the sense of a denomination or some kind of hierarchical, uh, you know, thing where he's going to run from off over yonder and tell people what to do. They've got to look to him and get answers. Here's what he's talking about. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, verse 11. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Now, I don't have a chalkboard, okay. I'll just do I'll walk it, okay. You see in verse 8 where he says he ascended up... He, he, uh, Verse number eight. Wherefore he said, when he ascended, when he when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. When did he give gifts to men? In the verse, he ascends up on high and gives gifts. Jesus Christ dies. He's buried. He's raised again. He ascends up into heaven. After he ascends into heaven, he's going to give some gifts unto men. This is not the gifts he gave before he ascended. See that in that verse. This is gifts he's going to give after he ascended. What are the gifts? Verse 11, he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. In his earthly ministry back here, he gave some apostles. They're called the 12 apostles. Those 12 apostles are, are designed their ministry. Jesus says, you 12, which have, you, which have followed me in the regeneration, and the Son of Man shall sit upon the throne of his glory. You'll sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. The reason there were 12 apostles is so they could judge, rule over each one of the tribes of Israel. Those are Israel's apostles. Acts chapter, Galatians chapter 2, verse 8, Paul says that Peter was, of, was the apostle of the circumcision. So Israel has apostles. But after Jesus Christ ascends into heaven, and if you look at verse 8, verse 9 and 10, it says, What is he that ascendeth up far above all heavens? That's not just where he ascended into the heavens in Acts chapter 1 to 8, where he's in heaven. Stephen sees him in Acts 7, and he says, The heavens are open. He's in the heavens. But after that, he ascends up above all heavens. So when he ascends up above all heavens, that's the position from which he saved the Apostle Paul. Saul of Tarsus made him Paul the Apostle. And in here, in the dispensation of grace, he gives some apostles. These are not these apostles back here in Israel. These are the apostles for the church, the body of Christ. You follow that? Dispensational Bible study is simply a timeline 
on which you lay out in, in order, in progressive order, the, ti the, the timing of the information God lays out in your Bible. Dispensational Bible study is not some screwball kind of a thought process that somebody came up and think this is a, this is a, a, uh, uh, a cute way to study the Bible. To rightly divide the, the scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul said the guy that errs about that, he said the resurrection is past. He didn't say there was no resurrection. He just got the resurrection in the wrong place on the timeline. Because what dispensational Bible study is, is laying out a timeline of God's word and then placing things on the position where they ought to go. So when you read about apostles, you don't just say, okay, he's an apostle. People say, well, Paul was really one of the 12 apostles. Well, you say, why do you say that? They say, well, he was an apostle. He saw Jesus. He had to be an apostle. Well, who told you that was what made a person an apostle? Well, that's what my preacher said. That's what Dr. DeHaan's book said. But that's not what Acts chapter 1 said. Now, who do you think ought to be right? I mean, you figure that out. You decide. You want to say the doctor so-and-so is right? That's all. That's, you, you got a right to say that. Just don't say the Bible said that. Because, see, I can read, somebody else in here can read, and you go to Acts chapter 1 and you read, and that isn't what it says. Acts chapter 1 said that in order to be one of the twelve apostles, you had to begin to follow with them, beginning at the baptism of John, all the way through to the day was taken up. As soon as you said that, what'd that do for Paul? Eh, he, doesn't, he doesn't qualify. But somebody said, well, he was an apostle. I know he was. I can read. He said, Paul, an apostle by the will of God. But he wasn't one of those apostles. Well, then who were they? You see, you, if you, you start asking, well, what? the only way to figure that out is to put that timeline out there. So in Ephesians chapter 4, Christ gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the body of Christ. Now why did he give them? Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints. Now by the way, before you can perfect a saint, you've got to make a saint. Okay? That's why you've got evangelists. Then you have pastors and teachers and so forth. You have all these communication gifts to preach the gospel, to see people, what's the will of God today? That all men be saved, come to the knowledge of the truth. You got to jail yesterday. He said, you know, Brother Jordan, pray for me that I do the will of God in my life. I said, well, what is God's will for your life? He says, well, I'm not real sure. I said, well, let me help you out. Here's a verse. <laughs> You don't have to wonder what God's will for your life is. And if you're sitting here tonight wondering what God's will for your life is, what you need to do is listen to what the verse says. God's will for your life is that you be saved. Do you know for sure you have eternal life as a present possession, your sins are forgiven, and you're just as sure as being in heaven right now if, if you were already there with the door shut behind you? If you don't have that kind of a, the assurance of understanding, you need to get it, and you can't have it simply by trusting Christ alone. You got that, then what? And come to the knowledge of the truth. Your Christian life won't operate on the basis of ignorance. God wants you to know what He's doing. It hasn't got anything to do with you in the sense of what you're doing. It's got, what is He doing? Because His will for your life is what He's doing. He chose you. He put you in Christ. He's made you a member of the body of Christ. He's blessed you with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. He's made you accepted in the beloved. He's, he's done all these things. He's made you. It's what He's doing. And you get in that book, learn how to rightly divide that word so you can understand what God's doing, and you take what you know God is doing, and then go do that in your life by faith, and you will be doing the will of God. You see, you don't come from the position of lack. You come from a position of complete sufficiency in Christ and in His Word. Somebody says, Lord, please reveal your will to me. If he was going to say something to you, he'd reach over heaven and say, I already have. <laughs> See, we say we believe the Bible is the, is the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. And then we, when it comes to our practice, we think we need something beside the Bible to be our authority. Whew. I feel like I need to let that kind of sink in a little bit. That was all commercial. <laughs> But that's important. 
Because when you realize that God's word is sufficient to tell you everything you need to know about everything you need to do, I hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither enter the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. You can't figure it out on your own. You can scrutinize your life. You can scrutinize what you need to do with your life, who you need to marry, what kind of job you need to have, what town you need to live in, you know, what color car you ought to buy. You can scrutinize that all you want to, and you never find the answer. But the next verse says, God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. You don't live in the ignorance of your, your resources. You live in the sufficiency of the revelation of God's will. And you know where he revealed it to you? In that book, which things we speak not in words of man's wisdom, but which the Holy Ghost teach. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2. There's the will of God. Now that's why you can have that kind of confidence, because there's the verse, there's the book, there's the issue. Now do you ever find things in your life you're not real sure what, ver what the verse is, what, what verse do I need? Well, now we're talking. <laughs> but what are we doing? We're taking the revealed will of God and applying it to our life. And you know what that'll do? That'll teach you what prayer is all about. Now you start talking about God about the real stuff. Talking to God about your life and what His Word says about what you're, you're dealing with and how to take what His Word says and put it to practice in your life. You try that for three or four years and you'll know something about what prayer is. And you'll quit sitting around looking at the stars and saying, Oh Lord, I wish I could figure out what I needed to tell you to do for me today. I just don't know, Lord. Oh, I know. And you get, you get down to some real Christian growth. Paul said, apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the bringing of the saints to maturity, to taking the truth of God and bringing you to a knowledge of it so that it works in you as an adult. Hebrews chapter 5, he says, you want to look at it instead of me quote it to you? Look at Hebrews 5. Y'all are getting bored. Let, let me. I can quote it and get more done. But if I show it to you, maybe, maybe it'll make more of an impact. How about that? Hebrews 5, verse 13. Verse 12, it says, For when, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. Right? They need to go back and get the ABCs. And have become as such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is what? You see how he defines that for you? If you are unskillful in the word of righteousness, at the bare minimum it would mean you couldn't rightly divide it. What are you? Spiritually. Brother Rick's not saying it. God through Hebrews is saying it. You're a babe. And if you've been saved long enough that you ought not be a baby... Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, i got things I'd like to tell you, but you can't bear them, for you're carnal, even as a babe in Christ. You're, st you're letting your own resources influence your life, not God's. But strong meat belong to them who are full age, even to those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You see, it's the use of God's Word, it's the taking of God's Word, and you're understanding God's Word, having an intelligent understanding of it, and then your faith application of that to your, to your life that gives you your use. The Word of God works effectually in you that believe, and it gives your senses the ability to discern. It give, it, you begin to grow up <laughs> in the maturity. The pastors, the teachers, evangelists, Apostles are for the perfecting of this, for growing, growing you, perfecting you, move you from milk to meat, baby to an adult. What are they for? What are you to be an adult Christian for? And you can swagger, you can walk now. I got, I'm, I'm here. All right, right, right? No, go back. Look. Why does he want you to be a perfected saint? Philippians two verse twelve. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of the Christ. Perfected saints are to do the work of the ministry. Then, by the way, who is to do the work of the ministry? <laughs> Perfected saints. You know what happens? Somebody gets saved, 
And they said, boy, you know, you've got to come down and give, give your testimony. And he comes down and gives his testimony about how he got saved. And, he, you know, boy, that sounds great. Come over here and teach class. Whoa, boy, look at and, and before long, oh, come over here and let, let's put you on the, on the church board. Let's, let's. And you know what he is? He's still a baby. But now you got him over here leading. Why? Because he's got a, you know, he, he talks good. Maybe he can shell out pretty good. Whatever. Maybe you just need somebody, a warm body, to fill a cold seat. I don't know. But what does this say? The perfected saint does the work of the ministry. Then the work of the ministry needs to be done by perfected saints. That's really important. What do perfected saints need to do? The work of the ministry. So when Paul leaves Titus at Crete to fix that which is wanting, what must be wanting? We need to get the work of the ministry done. What do we need? We, some, we need some perfected saints to do the work of the ministry. So Titus, what's he supposed to be doing down there? He's supposed to be getting some perfected saints organized together, functioning together, to do the work of the ministry. And that's why he says ordaining elders in every city. The, elder, the, the issue of the, of the elders and stuff, you go back to 1 Timothy 3, the issue there is just taking the work of the ministry and organizing it together the way God says it's to be organized together so that you have a first line of defense against the, the lie program. The first line of defense against the, the lie is, the, is the, 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 uh, the local church being the pillar and the ground of the truth in a community. So he says in verse 6, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife. Now he's talking now about the, about the men that he, you're going to have out to be, to be elders. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of right or, un, or unruly. For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, nor not, given, uh, not soon angry, not given to wine, no, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of, of hospitality, a lover of good men, a sober, just, holy, temperate. All those things simply describe a mature lifestyle of a godly man. Someone who understands who he is in Christ and has, has said, I'm going to present my body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is my reasonable service, and I'm not going to be conformed to this world, but I'm going to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. I'm going to live in the identity God has given me in Christ, in the details of my life, in my home, in my family, on my job, in my life, in my world. He's simply representing, as you go through Titus and you go through Timothy, the, the characteristics there, that's just really... The characteristics he expects of every man and every saint. This isn't something that only the leaders are to have. But among the saints, you're to pick out mature people who've reached and have demonstrated the ability to produce maturity in others. The front line, the, 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 the first line in the battle against the lie is... The, is, is, is this, this, the, these leaders in that local church who are sound in doctrine, sound in truth. The first line of defense, folks, against the lie program is not a religious system. It's not a denomination. It's not an organization. It's not a national organization. It's not a worldwide movement and church. It's local groups of believers organized together to do the work of the ministry where they are with leadership that is sound in doctrine, sound in the truth, and confuting and confounding and exhorting the, op the opposers, the ones that are spreading the lie. Verse 9, holding fast the faithful word as, as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers, for they are, there, there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. You know, I told you, Titus is living in the kind of world you and I live in. <laughs> you know, you, you, can read, you read that verse and you can see it all over, you, all, all over town. Whose mouths must be stopped. Who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lookers' sake. One of their, themselves, 
even a, a prophet of their own, said the, Cret the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. They lived in a really coarse, violent culture. Wherefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to, to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. You see, with the, 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 the whole issue, in fact, you read verse four, 10 to 14, it's not our text, but I'm talking about it. All the issues there are really right division issues. They that are, uh, verse 10, they, they, they that are unruly and vain talkers, deceit, deceivers, especially, they are the circumcision. Well, what do you think they're talking about? The people of the circumcision are trying to do what? That's this crowd over here taking you back over there. That's the people Paul dealt with in Acts chapter 15 and Galatians chapter 2. Here's people over here coming from over here, the doctrine over here, Israel's program, putting it on them over here. And it said, those people, their mouths must be stopped. You don't just say, well, praise God, let them go and do what they're doing. He said, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses. Did you ever read 2 Timothy chapter 2? What happens when you don't rightly divide the word? Look at 2 Timothy 2 verse 14. Of these things, put them in, in, my, in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit. They're using God's word, but it doesn't produce any profit, any value, any spiritual impact. You know how terrible it is for somebody to use God's word <laughs> and use it in such a way that it doesn't produce any impact in your life? That's deadening to people but to the subverting of the hearers. So they're using the Bible, but it's subverting. When you subvert something, you, you take the sub the underneath, invert it, turn it over, turn them upside down, or wrong side up, we would say in Alabama. Look down at verse 18. Who concerning the truth of error, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Here's two guys there saying, they're not saying there's no resurrection. Here they are, they say, we're part of the body of Christ. How's the dispensation of grace end? With the resurrection, right? They're saying the resurrection's past. If the rapture's past, where are you? You're in the trib. If you're in the trib, whose program is it? Israel's program. So there are some people that said the dispensation of grace is over and we're over here. You see how they got it wrong on the, on the, the, the resurrection? They, the, they got the dispensational timing of these things wrong? They're not saying, they're not denying the virgin birth, the deity of Christ, the resurrection. They're not saying there's no resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, there's some people that Paul says, how say some among you that there be no resurrection? There were people that denied the resurrection. You know what he said to them? Thou fool. I mean, you've got to be blind in one eye and can't see out of the other not to believe in resurrection. You can read 1 Corinthians 15, that'll take care of that. That's not these people. They just got it wrong. And what did they do? They overthrow, they subvert the faith of some. Paul said, you've got to get out here and stop their mouth. You've got to get out here and preach the whole fast that faithful word so that that kind of stuff gets rebuked. Then he says in verse, well by the way, 2 Timothy 2 verse 14 and 18 are either side of verse 15. See the answer to that's in verse 15, okay? Then he says in Titus 1 verse uh, 13, wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may, not, may, may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men. That's like what he says in, to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1. He says, I left you at, at Ephesus to charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Don't change what I taught you to teach. Neither give heed to fables. Don't listen to stories. Listen, that ministry is not an entertainment venue. Do you understand that the local church is not designed to be an entertainment society? 
That means in your local church, if entertainment, i.e. music, is the main draw and the main keeper and the main issue, and entertainment, you've missed the boat. Now, I love music. As my son playing that piano a while ago, all my boys have made him learn, learn to play the piano. He's the only one it took with. <laughs> the other ones were flubs. <laughs> but they learned, had to learn it. I've told people for years, if you've got a kid, teach them to play the piano. Boy, girl, teach them to play the piano. They, if they can play the piano, they can serve God. Because how many times you go to church and you'd like to have something, some music, nobody can play the piano, and nobody can stand to listen to you sing without some music to drown you out. I love music. I enjoy music. I'm not opposed to music. I'm not saying that. I'm saying if, if entertainment is the issue, Paul said, eh, don't, that, that's not what the local church is about. That's how you build thousands of people have an entertainment view. That's why you can go to the average evangelical church today and you, don't, you can't tell the difference between the auditorium you're sitting in to listen to the Word and around a rock venue. Because it isn't built for the teaching of the Word, it's built for the entertainment, for the entertainers to have a good venue, to have a good sound system, and be able to perform. Neither give heed to fables nor endless genealogies. That's the who's who. And if it's all built on personality and people and this person and that person and nobody, nobody makes the Bible so clear unless brother so-and-so is teaching it or this guy's got to be, and it's, who, it's the who's who. who. Who are you associated with? Who's your friend? Who do you know? Who, you're, who, who are your, listen, if it's the old buddy network and the network, if that's, Paul said, that isn't it. It's godly edifying in faith is the issue. Now I come to Titus, come back here, and that's, that's basically what he's talking about here. Holding fast the faithful word as he's been taught. So where did he get that faithful word? He got it from Paul, who gave it to Titus, who gave it to them. 2 Timothy 2.2 2. The things which thou hast heard of me among many, witness, among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who will teach others also. There's a chain. A passing of the baton, the information. And when you pass it to the next guy, and he passes it to the next person, and it's the same as you gave to this guy, then the job's been done. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. That he may be able, by sound doctrine, both to be able to, uh, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. He can stand there and he can exhort, he can take someone and bring them into understanding, he can convince, he can deal with, he can rebuke, he's able to give correction, reproof, and correction to people that need it. That is, there's the line, there's the, the defense against the era, the, the lie program, when it comes in. There is a spiritual battle involved. And listen, it starts in your home. It starts in your marriage. It starts in, it works itself through your, your children. It works itself out through your extended family. It works it out through your network. It works through your church family. The battle is, it's, in your, it, it's all out there in the world. But listen, it, didn't, it, it doesn't start way out yonder. It starts here where you are. And there is a spiritual battle and there is a spiritual assault against the truth of God as it resides in His people. And we're to hold fast. When you hold something fast, that means you get some convictions about something. I've had people tell me, said, you know, Brother Rick, you just talk like when you, when, when you say something that can't be any other way. Well, my wife will tell you, I'm a milk toast. I'm, you, you can argue with me in, in, all day long. He said, you just sound like it couldn't be any, if it was if I thought it was some other way, I would say it the other way. You understand that? If I say if I say something because I think it's that way, and I have some conviction about it, excuse me, but I believe it. 
I learned a long time ago that convictions are born in your heart, not in your head. You can get an idea, you can become convinced of something in your thinking, but until it resides in your heart and becomes a part of you, it's not a real conviction. It's a persuasion, but that's how you can become unpersuaded. <laughs> but when it becomes a conviction, it becomes something that's, that's part of you. That doesn't mean other people have to be your enemy. Second, Titus, Second Thessalonians 3, 15, Paul talks about some people, and he says, you're to separate from him because he's an enemy. But it, don't treat, treat him like a brother, not like an enemy. But a lot of times people don't think you can do that. People think if you disagree, you've got to whack people. Well, that's not, that's not a conviction. That's an uncertainty. You know, that's what religion does. You watch all this terrorism that goes on in the name of religion. The reason religious people become terrorists is out of insecurity. They, i got to be right. And if I'm not right, then God's going to be wrong or wronged. It helped me years ago as a young preacher to realize if God was willing to let somebody not believe something, I had to be willing to let them not believe it too. I, wa I wanted it more than they wanted it for them. I wanted, I wanted them to believe it and I, wa I was going to Fix it so they had to. And they didn't want it. And I'd go home and I'd, I'd fret. I'd say, Lord, open their eyes. And then it dawned on me, well, he wanted to open their eyes more than I did. He did everything necessary to do it. If he was willing to be patient with them. I've seen the Lord be patient with people for five years, ten years, thirty years. I saw a guy get saved a couple of years ago, he's 70 something years old. And after he got saved, I'm thinking, man, the Lord had been patient with that guy. How I many he hadn't <coughs> fried him all that time? Had every right to. <laughs> patiently waiting, patiently waiting. And when the guy turned to him in faith, he <coughs> saved him just like that. Didn't even hesitate. And I say, Lord, I, I get the message. My job's not to be you. My job's just do what you gave me to do. Preach the message. Put it out there. I can have a conviction. I can hold it. Hold it fast and not let it go. Because there's something in my heart. It's not my head got to figure it out. It's my heart's got it. And I know it's true because that book says it. You see what you're holding fast? I'm not holding fast religion. I'm not holding fast my doctrinal statement. I'm holding fast the faithful word. As I've been taught. Now that faithful word is that word rightly divided. That faithful word is that book the way God designed it to be studied and understood. One of the ways you hold it fast is you don't add to it and you don't subtract from it. Look with me at Deuteronomy chapter, two, chapter 4. God told Moses, told, told Israel through Moses. Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you for to do them that you may live and go in, in and prosper in the land and go in and possess the land that the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. You should not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Don't add anything to it. Don't leave anything out. Now when you don't add anything to it, and you don't leave anything out of it, you're doing exactly what he says. You're holding fast the faithful word. Look at 1 Timothy chapter, 2 Timothy chapter number 1. 
2 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 13. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to thy trust, committed unto thee, rather, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in you. You've got some truth, Paul said, just like Moses told Israel, God gave you his word and he gave it to you. Don't add anything to it. Don't leave anything out. Paul says he's given us his word here. He's given us a form of sound words. There they are in Romans to Philemon. And he put them together in a, in a particular form and structure for your edification. He said, hold that fast. That's what you're to hold on to. Just like Israel held on to Moses, we hold on to that. And as you hold on to that faithful, true, reliable word, the guys tomorrow are going to go through the faith, those faithful saying, faithful, faithful, what? It's true, it's trustworthy, it's reliable, you can depend on it. If you're going to preach the word, if you're going to hold fast to the faithful word, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to have it. You understand that? I know it's not popular, but we've never been worried about that, have we? But the Bible version issue is still an issue. You understand that? You look with me over at Proverbs chapter 30. I know people, you know, I know what people do. They say, let's take an aspirin and go to bed and hope, hope it goes away tomorrow. But the problem is there it still sits on the counter. Proverbs 30, verse number 5. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Moses said, don't add, don't diminish. Paul said, hold them fast. Every word of God is pure. If the book you hold in your hand you can't say about it what God says about His Word. You can't really, legitimately, honestly, without fudging, call it the Word of God. You understand that? Look at Proverbs chapter, I'm sorry, Psalm chapter 19. This is what gets you in trouble. Psalm 19, verse number 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statue of the Lord is right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. They're perfect. They're sure, they're right, they're pure, they're clean, they're true, they're righteous. That's what the Bible says about itself. So when you have a Bible, you need to be able to say that about it. What I've learned to do is when that discussion comes up, I just ask people. They say, well, Jordan, you know, you just, you're, just a, you're just an old King James guy. You're just an old hard-headed bigot. I watched that first. I, I, I could take one hour of that debate last night. And I watched, I watched them ask Donald Trump about the governor that said he was angry. Did you see that? I thought that, was, I, thought that was, I thought that was probably the best answer anybody could ever give. They're trying to needle him, saying, you're angry. And he said, I thought about it. And I thought, doggone right I'm angry. That's not an insult, that's the truth. And he said, I got a right to be angry. And he starts naming the reasons. And I thought, you know, you can like that guy, not like him, but he ain't no weenie. 
He looks it right in the eye and says what he thinks. Well, I'd rather be known that way than any other way. Just put it waist high right across the plate. You don't like it? Miss it. Hit it out of the park. I don't care. I have my conviction. But when you talk to somebody and they say, well, I don't think that King James Bible stuff ought to be talked about. i got a question for you. Where is your Bible that is pure, that is right, that is sure, that doesn't have mistakes in it? Can I tell you, after over 40 years of talking to people, big shots, little shots, shots, middle shots, what the answer will always be? You know what it'll be. They don't have one. And they don't like you if you do. Now, I've, been, I've done a lot of work with lost people. And they don't like you to have a Bible. And they get mad at you if you have one. And when you meet Christian people, good, wonderful, sweet, grace people, gracious, who get mad at you, who talk to you like lost people talk to you. I think Ephesians 4 verse 17 and 8 said, teen said, don't do that. You get a Bible, like the New International Version, that tells you that Elhana killed Goliath and Samuel. You know that passage in Samuel where David's talking about his mighty men and it says that Elhana killed the brother of Goliath, and the new Bibles leave out brother of, and says Elhana killed Goliath. Did you know that? This one, I, this one is a funny one, and I like it because it's funny. The, the New International Version says, Lisa, says Elhana killed Goliath. Did you know that in the fall of, this, of last year, the latest edition of the New International Version has fixed that verse? Go look it up on the internet. They fixed it. <laughs> so now if you've got a new international version, one of them will say, Elhana killed Goliath, and the other one will say, Elhana killed the brother of Goliath. Now what do you do? <laughs> I'm at the jail, I'm, I, I'm, I'm at the church, and I, I see in the, in the pew there they've got a, a new international version, and I looked at it and said, which one is it? Because now you've got two of the same versions saying two different things. And I go, holy moly, now what do we do? But you know what happens? People just say, well, what difference does it make? If that's your attitude, then your attitude about the Word of God is different than the Word of God's attitude about itself. The most dangerous version, modern version, is not the New International or the New American Standard or even the ESV. The most dangerous English Bible today is the New King James Bible. Because it's, it's some people who understand there's a textual reason not to use the new versions. But they, you know what a mugwomp is? A mugwomp. <laughs> so you're not from Alabama. Aren't you happy about that? I don't know. <laughs> a mugwomp is a guy who sits on a fence. His mug's on one side and his wump's on the other. <laughs> and he can't figure out which way he wants to go. <laughs> and you, so you call him a mugwomp. <laughs> don't go that way? No, I'm going to go that way. Don't go that way? Don't go that way. <laughs> and I call it the mugwomp version because he it'll have the right text almost, not 100%, but most of the time, almost all the time. And then it will turn right around and use the corrupt translation methods and methodologies. For example, it won't say the faith of Christ. Just leaves that out. Like it made good sense to do that. And it doesn't. You say, well, why do you do it? All the mock, oh, you know, Dr. Mount said that's the way you're supposed to do it. 
Yeah, but have you ever looked at all the rest of the things he says you ought to do? He says you ought to say that Isaiah wrote Malachi 3, 1. And you ought to say Mark 1 says that he did. You say, well, wait a minute. I've got a... I brought three new sets of studies back on the table back there. One about educating angels. It's all new material. One about... If you've ever wondered how God's Word is designed to work inside of you and you've been made internally in your spirit, soul, and body to have God's Word work in you and work out through you, there's a four-part study called Inside Out that's back there. And there's a, a third one called the Mugwomp Version. <laughs> and listen, I, I have friends that think they're doing God's service by using a New King James Bible because they say, well... We're not going with the liberals. Yeah, you, you're, on the, you're, you're a mugwump. You're on, the, you're on the fence. And God told that church at Laodicea, I would that you were cold or hot, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going <laughs> to throw you out. It's the lukewarm mugwump that God doesn't want. If you're going to be wrong, be out and out wrong. But have some conviction about it. I don't recommend you be wrong. But at least somebody could respect your convictions instead of being a mugwomp trying to sit on the fence, curry the, 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 the favor of the other side, and yet say you're over here and you ain't over here, bud. Sorry. Now you say, Brother Rick, now you don't know what... I, I understand what I'm saying. I understand that doesn't make friends and influence people in, in, a, in a way to be congenial to you. I don't... I understand that. I, I'm willing to suffer the slings and arrows of, of fate that come that because of that. But you need to understand, folks, to hold fast the faithful word doesn't mean to hold almost hold fast the faithful word. It doesn't mean to be a mugwomp. It means to get the book, know you got the book, and stand on the book rightly divided and let that be the issue. And hold fast to it. Let me show you a guy who knew how to do that. Come back to the book of Job. You know who old Job was. Bless his heart, what a guy that gets beat around the bush. For many years, Job was, has been one of my favorite books. My favorite book's always the book I'm teaching right now. I'm fixing to teach, start teaching the book of Obadiah next Wednesday night. Obadiah's only 21 verses, the shortest book in the Old Testament. I told folks when, when we started it, when I'm teaching through the Minor Prophets in the middle of the week, I told them, I said, you know, it takes us forever to get through a book. In 21 chap verses, you think you could get that, what, in about three weeks? And I said, I think it's going to take at least 25 weeks to do that one little book. Because <laughs> the, the more you delve into it, the more, the more, the more stuff there is. You've got to know about the book to understand what's going on there. But when I just want to relax sometime and just have a good, you just, just clear my mind and sit and just kind of, you know, chuckle kind of thing. Years ago when I was young, I used to read Mad Magazine. You guys ever do that? You know, just get, give you a little, little chuckle. Now I read Wired Magazine, that kind of stuff. But if I just want to have one of those relaxing, I read the book. I like the book of Job. Because Job and those, two, those three miserable friends that he had, miserable comforters, he calls them. Uh, I mean, these are guys his daddy's age. But boy, are they terrible. And he, they get going back and forth. Yeah, they call each other names, the old windbag. Yeah. And in all of that controversy, Job chapter 2, verse number 3. The Lord said to Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect man, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And still, after all this stuff that's happened to him, he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. Job's lost his family. He's lost his fortune. He's lost his reputation. He's out sitting on an ash heap, scraping the, the, the boils with the, with, the, with the broken potsherd on the ash heap. And then he gets all these friends come by and start telling him it's all because he's an old, old rotten sinner and God's, God's, God's 
punishing him for it and all that kind of, and he sits out there and God says, have you been looking at Job? He has not, he has held fast his integrity in spite of all that. Now I want you to look over chapter 23 because it's important you understand what it meant by him holding fast his integrity. Chapter 23 verse 12, Job is talking. 23.12, neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. You know how Job held fast his integrity in the midst of all of that that befell him? He said, I haven't gone back I haven't let go. I haven't moved off of His Word. I have esteemed His Word more than my necessary food. The thing that has fed my soul, the thing that has gotten me through, has been what God said to me. His Word. You want to hold fast the faithful word? You want to hold fast your integrity as a member of the body of Christ in the vicissitudes and the conflicts and the struggles of life? You desire that word. You desire that book rightly divided. Listen, when you desire his word more than your necessary food, it will lead you to understand God's word rightly divided. Because when you're going to go through what you go through in life and the circumstances of life and you're going to look to God's word for answers, if you look in the wrong places, those wrong places won't work. I bought my wife a stove a couple of weeks ago at Sears, at Kenmore. Page 24 of, the, of this nice new, last year it was rated by Consumer Reports as the best stove on the market. Page 24 and 25 of the owner's manual explains that this stove has a Sabbath day setting on it. <laughs> Honest. Bought it at Sears. Got Kenmore right on it. A Sabbath day setting so that you can set it so that one day a week it will not come on you can't make it come on the burners won't work the oven won't work nothing will work <laughs> now on Friday on the day before that day you can preset the oven to come on to bake so you can bake your bread but you set it on Friday so on Saturday you don't do anything it just comes on automatically and when the bed, bread is baked, the oven unlocks and you can open it without working. Yeah. <laughs> Only Sears would think of that. <laughs> Bless their heart. <laughs> yeah, oh dear. <laughs> and I go, wow. The problem with that is in Exodus 35, verse 2, which is the verse they're trying to obey, it says you can't light your stove on the Sabbath day. If you set it on Friday to light on Saturday, when does it light? See, you didn't, you, you really didn't get around it. Do you understand, if you're going to try to be an old teller, you're going to say, I, I want to know whether I should go to, go to go, if I should. Do you ever struggle with a question? We go to church on Sunday and then we go out to eat. Should we go out to eat or shouldn't we go out to eat? We make people work. We don't make them work. I've, I know people that have used Exodus 35 verse 2 to say, no, you shouldn't go out to work, eat on Sunday. 
Sunday's a Christian Sabbath and you shouldn't go out and make somebody, but wait a minute, somebody else says, but you should go out to eat because you can't cook at home on Sunday. <laughs> but see, then you begin to think about it and you say, but wait a minute, Sunday isn't the Sabbath, Saturday's the Sabbath. That's Israel under the law, that's not me over here. The God that did that had to offer animal sacrifices, I don't do that. So all of a sudden you'll become a dispensationalist and say, that's over there, this is over here. I want to do God's will and I begin to think about it and I begin to study about it. And, I, and I, if you're just honest, you'll see how that won't work. Because it isn't who you are. And it'll bring, eventually it'll bring you over here. Because this is what God's doing. And you've never been a big, big enough day in your life to make God do something he isn't doing. And when you really want to do God's will, and you're wanting to go to God's word and let God's word tell you what God's will is and follow what God's word says is his will. And to see that the, the exceeding greatness of the power of his word working in your life as his spirit takes his word and works, makes it, energizes your life because you believe it. You'll work your way. It'll take you there. There's no other place for it to take you. And when you fall short of that, it's because there's something else going on. So when I want to do His will in my life, I need to know what His will. I need to go to the Bible, find out what it is. It's a big book. I don't know how to study it. I find out here's how He says study it. So now I've got an internal motivation. It's not somebody trying to pound you into listening to this. It's I want to know. And I get a hunger. It comes from my heart. That's when it becomes a conviction. And that's when you can hold, that's when you desire it more than your necessary food. I got to get this before I eat. Hold fast. The faithful word. That. You can be a part of that front line defense against the era by proclaiming the truth. Be like Job, one that God can say he has, he's held fast to his integrity. Why? I haven't turned aside from his, his commandments. I've desired his word more than my necessary food. Now I know I'm preaching to the choir in the sense that if you didn't have that attitude you wouldn't be here. But Paul tells Timothy not just to convince people, but to exhort. And if I know anything about life, and I know anything about you, I know, thing, I, I know something about myself, so I know something about you, you have to be continuously encouraged in those things. You have to have some motivation in it. That's why Paul in his epistles is constantly encouraging and motivating the believers to hold fast that form of sound words which is committed to us. Hold fast that faithful word. Learn it. Live it for his glory. And be like Job. Have that heartfelt desire for it that reaches down into your inner man and you know, we all have things down inside of us. If you knew everything that was inside of me, you wouldn't want to listen to me. And if I knew everything inside of you, you wouldn't want to listen. I wouldn't want to talk to you. We all have things. Things we don't tell anybody else, but God knows them and we know them. Things sometimes that other people know that Oh, God, don't let anybody else find out about it. Some of us say, nope, not me. Not me. I'm okay. Some of us bear the burden of it, and it weights us down. The answer for all of it is Calvary. The only answer for our failures is his strength. The only answer for our sin is his blood. The only answer for our death is his life. That's what that book does. 
Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And it's when your heart, with the heart man believes, when your heart says, Lord, I'm going to believe what you say, in spite of how I feel about it, because your emotions don't believe, your emotions respond. That's all they can do. But they will terrorize your mind and unsettle your heart. Your emotions. You see, you have a mind, a will, and emotions. That's the way you're supposed to operate. But if you let your emotions be what runs your mind, it'll terrorize your will. And you're screwed put it bluntly, and you're under, you, you become a prisoner of emotional revolt. The answer is just to do it the other, do it God's way. He said, well, my emotions don't like that. <laughs> so, did you ever have to do anything you didn't like to do? Just because your emotions didn't like it didn't mean you didn't have to do it. I bet on Monday morning when the buzzer runs off, goes off, you don't go, oh, I get to go to work again today. I don't. But you get up and go because you make a choice. Hold fast that faithful word. It works, folks. It's God's Word. Wherever you are, whatever your life's about, whatever you're doing, whatever you are on the scale of your spiritual growth, it's God's Word that makes the difference. If you never trusted Christ as your Savior, you never passed from death to life. I'm talking about religion. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to move a muscle. You don't have to pray a prayer. If you had to do that much, you'd never know if you did it right. Not even that. God looks down at your, at your heart, at the quietness and stillness of who you are inside, that nobody knows but you and him. And he waits to see your faith rest in his son exclusively. And say, Lord, if he can't, I perish. And he'll save you. And it takes place in that stillness and the privacy of your inner self. And when you do that, that word becomes life, just like that. And it becomes light. And everything's different. You won't feel anything, necessarily. Because it isn't a feeling issue. It's a faith issue. But can I tell you, once you have the faith and you understand what's happened, the fruit comes. And when the fruit comes, who cares about the feeling then? Because now life is there. If you are saved, and I know most of you probably are, it's the word of life that we hold on to. The word of God that works effectually in you that believe. Father, thank you now for this weekend, for these folks that have come to be to study and to enjoy the, 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 the time in the word. And I pray that it would be something that works in us. The kind of internal integrity that it did in Job. In Christ's name, amen.